Hi, welcome to my ECG video blog. I'm Ken Grauer, and this is my 13th ECG video blog. Today's topic involves determination of axis and diagnosis of the hemiblocks. My goal is to simplify these two important ECG topics while still retaining accuracy. So while my approach is easy to learn, it will still effectively identify the key clinical information that you need to know in a way that allows you to estimate axis and diagnose whatever hemiblock may or may not be present in less than five seconds. Once again, for your convenience, I've made a website that lists key links to my ECG blog, my video blogs, and my introductory and advanced books and EPUBs on ECG interpretation. The easy to remember link to access this video is www.accessecg.com. And finally, my email address. Please write me with your comments, feedback, and questions. On to today's topic. The first question is why care about access at all? The clinical reality is that we just don't learn that much from determining the axis. We do need to calculate axis when assessing for hemiblocks, and axis is important in assessing for right ventricular hypertrophy, though not so for LVH since many patients with even marked left ventricular hypertrophy do not have a leftward axis. And while the ECG is never definitive for diagnosing acute pulmonary embolism, recognition of a clear axis shift to the right is supportive of this diagnosis when seen in the right clinical setting. Recognition of a marked axis shift, especially when the QRS complex is all negative in lead one and all positive in AVR, strongly suggests either mix-up of the left and right arm electrodes or dextrocardia. And finally, we use axis determination all the time in assessment of the regular wide complex tachycardia. The finding of an all negative QRS complex in either lead one or in lead AVF strongly suggests that the wide tachycardia is VT. But as helpful as each of these clinical uses of axis are, apart from recognition of left anterior hemiblock, which is common, determination of axis usually adds no more than limited clinical information to the interpretation of most ECGs. The good news is that if determining the axis is among your least favorite things to do, the computerized report is usually very accurate in its calculation of axis. That said, accurate estimation of axis is easy and can be readily accomplished in less than five seconds, as we'll see in a moment. What then is axis? We define the mean QRS axis as the average direction of the heart's electrical activity in the frontal plane, as the left and right ventricles are depolarized. So, axis is based on assessment of the heart's electrical activity during ventricular activation. Let's look at the normal activation process, which is what happens with sinus rhythm and no bundle branch block. So the electrical impulse begins in the SA node. From there, it travels through specialized intraatrial pathways to quickly arrive at the AV node, which we schematically illustrate with the red arrow. The impulse slows down a bit in its path through the AV node, after which it enters the bundle of Hiss and the bundle branch system. This is where ventricular activation begins. Conduction accelerates as the smaller right ventricle depolarizes at the same time as the larger left ventricle. The average direction of this ventricular activation is the electrical axis, blue arrow. We emphasize several points. Although there is some correlation between electrical axis and the heart's anatomic location in the chest,
both normally being directed toward the left, this correlation is far from perfect. For example, certain conduction defects may shift the axis rightward because the left and right ventricles no longer depolarize at the same time, despite the fact that the anatomic location of the heart does not change. So the concept of axis is an electrical phenomenon. And finally, we need to remember that the process of ventricular activation takes place in three dimensions, and not just the two dimensions of the frontal plane. The precordial, or chest leads, record the heart's electrical activity in the third dimension, which is the horizontal or transverse plane. So when we talk about axis, we are only referring to the average direction of the heart's electrical activity in the frontal plane. Let's apply this to the recording of a 12-lead ECG, which we show here with simultaneous recording of the three standard leads, which are leads one, two, and three. The three augmented leads which are leads AVR, AVL, and AVF, and the six precordial or chest leads, which are leads V1 through V6. We ignore the six chest leads in our determination of axis because these leads view the heart's electrical activity in the transverse or horizontal plane. Instead, we determine the axis from the six limb leads, which view the heart's electrical activity in the frontal plane. Looking closer, lead one views the heart's electrical activity from a horizontal perspective at zero degrees. The other standard limb leads are each 60 degrees away, corresponding to Eindhoven's equilateral triangle in which each angle of this triangle has 60 degrees. Thus, lead 2 is positioned at plus 60 degrees, and lead 3 is positioned at plus 120 degrees. If we look in the negative direction, lead minus 3 is positioned here, at minus 60 degrees. Note that lead minus 3 is 60 degrees away from lead 1, or at minus 60 degrees. This leaves us with the three augmented leads that complete our frontal plane assessment. I think of the augmented leads as forming a Mercedes-Benz triangle, in which lead AVF looks vertically upward from the feet, at a perspective that corresponds to plus 90 degrees. Lead AVL looks down from the left shoulder, in between lead 1 and lead minus 3, from a perspective that corresponds to minus 30 degrees. Finally, lead AVR is the most remote lead in that it views the heart from furthest away. Lead AVR looks down at the heart from the right shoulder. For practical purposes, we only need to focus on the appearance of the QRS complex in three of these six limb leads to estimate axis and determine if a hemi block is present. These three leads are lead one at zero degrees, lead AVF at plus 90 degrees, and lead 2 at plus 60 degrees, which, as we'll see momentarily, will instantly allow us to determine whether or not a left anterior hemiblock is present. We are almost ready to apply our rapid method for axis calculation, as soon as we discuss a few final principles. Foremost among these are the three basic laws of electrocardiography, which allow us to determine the direction and relative size of the ECG waveform. By convention, electrode polarity was selected by our ECG founding fathers so that most QRS complexes in most ECG leads of most patients will normally be positive. ECG law number one states that a wave of electrical activity moving toward a recording electrode will write a positive deflection on the ECG, panel A. In contrast, law number two states that a wave of electrical activity moving away from a recording electrode will write a negative deflection 
panel B. This is why the QRS deflection in lead AVR is normally predominantly negative, because this most remote lead that looks down at the heart from the distant right shoulder typically sees predominant electrical activity as moving away from AVR in its path toward the left ventricle. Conditions such as RVH or lead misplacement may alter the direction of electrical activity with respect to lead AVR, in which case AVR may be positive. Finally, law number three states that if the recording electrode is positioned perpendicular, that is at 90 degrees to the direction of the wave of depolarization, then an isoelectric or equiphasic complex that is with equal parts up and down will be written. As we will see in a moment, the mean QRS axis in the frontal plane is closest to that lead which manifests the greatest absolute positive deflection. And if any of the limb leads are isoelectric, then the axis will be approximately 90 degrees away from that isoelectric lead. How then do we classify the axis? The most practical answer is by the quadrant approach. Only two leads are needed to determine within which 90 degree quadrant the axis lies. These two leads are lead one at zero degrees and lead AVF at plus 90 degrees. A normal axis is defined by the limits of these two leads, that is within zero to plus 90 degrees. This is not to say that an axis of minus 5 or minus 10 degrees or one of plus 95 degrees that falls slightly outside of these limits is abnormal, but rather to say that life is simpler and appropriately accurate if we accept the quadrant approach. We can then determine the quadrant within which the axis lies within no more than two to three seconds. So, a normal axis is defined as lying between zero and plus 90 degrees. As to the other three quadrants, we say there is RAD, that is right axis deviation, if the axis lies between plus 91 to plus 180 degrees, or in this quadrant right here. We say there is LAD, or left axis deviation, if the axis is between minus 1 to minus 90 degrees or in this upper left quadrant. And we say that the axis is indeterminate if it lies in this upper left or northwest quadrant between plus 180 and plus 270 degrees, with selection of the term indeterminate derived from the fact that we cannot tell if an indeterminate axis represents marked right or marked left axis deviation. Instead, it is indeterminate. How then to determine if the axis is normal? Answering this question is made easy by the quadrant approach. All we need to do is to look at both leads 1 and AVF. If the net QRS deflection is positive in both of these leads, then the axis is normal. By the term net QRS deflection, we mentally add up the magnitude of the positive deflection in the QRS and mentally subtract from this the combined magnitude of any negative deflections. For example, the monophasic all upright R wave in A is all positive. In B, we see a positive R wave and a negative S wave. But doesn't the R wave look to be at least a little bit taller than the S wave is deep? Since it does, there is a small net positive deflection in B. In C, the tall amplitude of the positive R wave clearly outweighs the combined negativity of the small Q and S waves. And in D, even though the R wave is small, there is no opposing negative deflection. Therefore, each of these four examples manifest a net positive QRS deflection, albeit the net amount of positivity for B and for D is relatively small. Let's look closer at why, when the QRS deflection in both lead 1 and lead AVF is positive, 
the axis is normal. Here is lead one at zero degrees. If lead one was isoelectric, that is, equal parts positive and negative, then by the third law of electrocardiography, the axis will be perpendicular to lead one or 90 degrees away in either direction, either here or here. But if the QRS deflection is more positive than negative, then the axis will be less than 90 degrees away from lead one, which will place the axis somewhere within this left hemisphere. The same holds true with respect to lead AVF. If the net QRS deflection of lead AVF is more positive than negative, then the axis will lie less than 90 degrees away from lead AVF in either direction, which will place the axis within this lower hemisphere. The only way we can have an axis that lies both within the left and inferior hemisphere is if the axis lies between 0 to 90 degrees. Therefore, as soon as we establish that the net QRS deflection in both leads 1 and AVF is positive, we know that the axis is normal, that is, between 0 to 90 degrees. We can then fine-tune our assessment of axis by estimating the relative amount of the net QRS deflection. For example, if the net QRS deflection of both lead 1 at 0 degrees and of lead AVF at plus 90 degrees is equally positive, then the axis will lie equally in between these leads, or at plus 45 degrees. If instead lead AVF is more positive, then the axis will be closer to AVF with its precise location depending on how much more positive AVF is. Let's apply what we've covered by estimating the mean frontal plane axis for a series of tracings. To accomplish this, all we need to do is to look at leads 1 and AVF and estimate the relative net QRS deflection in these two leads. To facilitate our estimation of axis, we use this simple drawing with lead 1 at 0 degrees and lead AVF at plus 90 degrees. Note that we only provide QRS complexes for these two leads. Looking first at lead 1 within the red rectangle, there is a small and narrow Q wave, a tall R wave, and a tiny terminal S wave. We schematically illustrate the relative amount of net positivity by the horizontal red arrow in the axis diagram. In lead AVF, we see that the QRS complex has a small, narrow Q wave and a tall R wave, but no terminal S wave. This again results in a net positive deflection of approximately the same amount of net positivity as was seen in lead 1. Therefore, the mean axis is approximately halfway between lead 1 and lead AVF, or about 40 to 50 degrees. This is a normal axis. The precise measurement is much less important clinically than knowing the axis falls within the normal 0 to plus 90 degree quadrant. It's fine if we are off even by 20 to 30 degrees as long as we know that the axis falls well within the normal quadrant range. Is this still a normal axis? Our goal is for you to be able to look at the QRS complex in leads 1 and AVF and to know within seconds that the axis still is within the normal range. To accomplish this goal, we once again make use of our schematic axis diagram where lead 1 is at 0 degrees and lead AVF is at plus 90 degrees. Focusing first on the QRS complex in lead 1, Within the red rectangle, QRS amplitude of the complex in lead 1 is small, but nevertheless all positive, which we schematically illustrate by a small amplitude horizontal red arrow in our axis diagram. In lead AVF, within the blue rectangle, we see a QR complex with a small negative Q wave deflection and a much larger positive R wave. So the net deflection in lead AVF is positive, 
and of much larger magnitude than the small positive deflection in lead one. This results in a mean QRS axis within the normal range and clearly much closer to lead AVF. We would gladly accept an axis estimation of anywhere between plus 60 to plus 80 degrees. But at the least, we want you to be comfortable recognizing within two to three seconds that the axis here is within the normal range because the net QRS deflection in both lead one and in lead AVF is positive and that the axis lies closer to lead AVF than to lead one because the net deflection in AVF is greater. So what's the axis here? As opposed to the previous examples we've shown, the QRS complex is now predominantly negative in lead one, which we schematically illustrate by a horizontal red arrow oriented in the direction of negative lead one. This places the axis in the right hemisphere. The net QRS deflection in lead AVF is still clearly positive, so the axis is inferior. Estimating the average direction for these two vectors, it should be clear that there is considerable RAD, that is, right axis deviation. Whether the actual number of degrees for the axis is plus 100, plus 110, or plus 120 degrees is not only difficult to tell, but not important clinically. What counts is that there clearly is RAD. The ECG finding of definite RAD, as is seen here, is not overly common in adults. Seeing RAD should therefore prompt consideration of the following, depending on the clinical scenario. RVH, or right ventricular hypertrophy, left posterior hemiblock, which we'll discuss momentarily, acute right heart strain, as might be seen with acute pulmonary embolism, or possibly a normal variant if each of these other conditions is ruled out. Clinical correlation is needed for interpretation. So, in which quadrant is the axis? We'll start with lead one, in which the QRS complex is predominantly negative. This places the axis in the right hemisphere. This time, the QRS complex is also predominantly negative in lead AVF, which places the axis in the upper hemisphere. Putting these two QRS deflections together, the average direction of the heart's electrical activity lies within the upper right quadrant, or in no man's land. No woman's land, no person's land. It's lonely in no man's land. We call this an indeterminate axis, since we cannot tell if there is marked left axis deviation or marked right axis deviation as the cause. The clinical points to emphasize are, one, that we can tell at a glance when the axis is indeterminate, because the net QRS deflection in both lead one and in lead AVF is negative and two, that the ECG finding of an indeterminate axis should make us think of the following three entities, RVH, COPD or severe pulmonary disease, or large body habitus. What about the axis here? Starting once again with lead one, the net QRS is all positive, so the axis clearly lies within the left hemisphere. But what about lead AVF? The QRS complex in lead AVF is isoelectric, that is, equal parts positive and negative. Whenever we see a QRS complex that is isoelectric, we know that the axis will lie approximately 90 degrees away from that lead. Schematically, for the case shown here, we draw in a small blue line in the direction of lead AVF which tells us that the axis will be perpendicular to this lead or at about zero degrees. Therefore, lead AVF is the lead that tells us if there is a leftward axis. Left axis deviation is present if the net QRS deflection in lead AVF is more negative than positive. 
For example, in which quadrant does the axis lie? Using our axis diagram, we once again look first at lead 1. The net QRS deflection in lead 1 is clearly positive, so the axis lies within the left hemisphere. In contrast, the net QRS deflection in lead AVF is predominantly negative, so we schematically draw our blue arrow in the direction of negative lead AVF, which puts the axis in the upper hemisphere. The net effect of these two vectors defines the axis as lying within the upper left quadrant, which means there is LAD, or left axis, deviation. Clinically, what do we care about? Given that a small amount of left axis deviation is common and not really abnormal, what we care about clinically is whether the degree of LAD is pathologic. This brings up the issue of how to quickly and accurately recognize the hemiblocks, which serves as our focus for the remainder of this ECG video. One of the most confusing areas in ECG interpretation relates to recognition of the hemiblocks. We'd like to propose an approach to simplify this issue. Let's start by defining what we mean by the term hemiblock. Think of what happens with the heart's normal conduction system. With normal sinus rhythm, the impulse begins in the SA node. From there, the impulse is rapidly transmitted through intraatrial conduction pathways to the AV node. Once through the AV node, the impulse enters the bundle of Hiss and then the left and right bundle branches. So what happens with bundle branch block? Let's look first at right bundle branch block. We schematically show the conduction defect in the thin right bundle branch when there is complete right bundle branch block. How about what happens with left bundle branch block? We schematically illustrate what happens with this conduction defect by a proximal block in the common left main bundle branch. In contrast, the defect with a hemi block is more distal. Realize that in real life, there are hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of specialized fibers that make up each portion of the heart's conduction system. A large portion of these fibers in the left bundle branch travel a little bit in front of, or anterior, to most of the remaining fibers that travel behind. We call this collection of more anterior fibers the anterior hemifascicle, shown in blue. The larger posterior collection of fibers is the posterior hemifascicle. A hemiblock is simply a conduction defect in one or the other of these two major divisions in the common left bundle branch. Since there are two hemifascicles, there are two possible forms of hemiblock, which are anterior or posterior. Key points. As we've said, there are two types of hemiblock, anterior and posterior. And left posterior hemiblock is rare. There are at least two reasons to explain this. First, the left posterior hemifascicle is a much thicker collection of conduction fibers than the anterior hemifascicle. We schematically show the thin anterior hemifascicle in blue. And, the much thicker posterior hemifascicle in red. In addition, the posterior hemifascicle has a dual blood supply from the right and left coronary arteries, whereas the anterior hemifascicle does not. Although I've never seen statistics on this, in my experience, up to 99% of all hemiblocks are anterior. Even the experts often do not agree on those few occasions when legitimate left posterior hemiblock is present. So even if you never diagnose a posterior hemiblock, you are probably none the worse. But given how much more frequent left anterior hemiblock is, if there is a hemiblock, but you don't have the foggiest idea of which one it is, which one should you guess?
Let's look closer at what left anterior hemiblock is. The clinical reality is that even among experienced interpreters, there is no consensus on how we define left anterior hemiblock. Some define it by a certain amount of left axis deviation, with the numbers most often cited being an axis more negative than minus 30 degrees, minus 45 degrees, or minus 60 degrees. A better definition incorporates QRS morphology. With pure left anterior hemiblock, there should be a small Q wave with tall R wave in lead one, and the opposite pattern, that is a small R wave with deep S wave in leads two and three. The problem is that many patients have what I call associated competing conditions, such as prior infarction or scarring from cardiomyopathy. For example, formation of inferior Q waves that are the marker of inferior infarction may obliterate the small r deep S wave pattern that we expect to see when there is left anterior hemiblock. By the same token, left anterior hemiblock may hide inferior Q waves of a prior infarction. So, ECG assessment does entail a number of complexities. I'd like to present my approach to the ECG diagnosis of left anterior hemiblock, which simplifies assessment, yet remains as accurate as any other approach you might encounter, with the distinct advantage of allowing you to make the ECG diagnosis of left anterior hemiblock in less than five seconds. To do this, we equate left anterior hemiblock with a pathologic left axis. I define pathologic left axis as an axis more negative than minus 30 degrees. The key feature of my approach is that it is easy to tell at a glance if the axis is more negative than minus 30. Assuming lead one is positive, as it will almost always be, left anterior hemiblock will be present if there is a net negative deflection in lead two. How then can we quickly recognize if pathologic left axis is present? We first need to appreciate the meaning of an isoelectric complex. This is an equiphasic or isoelectric QRS complex. The positive deflection is equal in size to the negative deflection of this isoelectric complex. As we have already mentioned, the finding of an isoelectric QRS complex in one of the limb leads indicates that the mean QRS axis lies approximately 90 degrees away from that lead. Look now at this next QRS complex in green. Is the QRS more positive or more negative? I hope you can appreciate that the net QRS deflection is slightly more positive, which means that the axis lies slightly less than 90 degrees away from this lead. Compare this to this next QRS complex in blue. Is the QRS more positive or more negative? I hope you can now appreciate that the net QRS deflection is slightly more negative, which means that the axis must now lie slightly more than 90 degrees away from this lead. My approach to hemiblock diagnosis simply applies this principle with focus on the appearance of the QRS complex in lead two. So to determine the axis, and to assess for the presence of hemiblock, we primarily use three of the six limb leads. These are lead one at zero degrees, lead AVF at plus 90 degrees, and lead two at plus 60 degrees. If leads one and AVF tell us there is left axis deviation, then we focus on lead two to tell us whether left anterior hemiblock is or is not present. If the QRS complex in lead two looks like this, equal parts positive and negative or isoelectric, then the axis is perpendicular, that is 90 degrees away from lead two, which would place the axis precisely at minus 30 degrees.
So all you have to do is look at lead two to tell if there is left anterior hemiblock. If lead two looks like this in green, that is slightly more positive than negative, then the axis lies less than 90 degrees away or not far enough leftward to qualify as left anterior hemiblock. It doesn't matter if the axis is minus 10 or minus 20 degrees, because in either case, there is not enough of a leftward axis to qualify as left anterior hemiblock. On the other hand, if the QRS complex in lead two looks like this in blue, with a more negative than positive QRS complex, then the axis lies more than 90 degrees away from lead two which qualifies as left anterior hemiblock. Let's put this approach to practice. Is there left anterior hemiblock? We show you the three key leads for axis determination. Using our axis diagram, we start with lead one. The all positive QRS deflection in lead one places the axis within the left hemisphere. However, isn't lead AVF slightly more negative than positive? This places the axis in the upper hemisphere, which means there is LAD, or left axis deviation. The question is whether the amount of left axis deviation is enough to qualify as left anterior hemiblock. Which lead should we look at to determine this? The answer is lead two which lies at plus 60 degrees. Is the net QRS deflection in lead two more positive or more negative? The answer is that it is slightly more positive, which means that the axis must lie less than 90 degrees away from lead two, or not quite leftward enough to qualify as left anterior hemiblock. On the other hand, what if lead two looked like this? with a net QRS deflection that is at least slightly more negative than positive. In this case, the axis will lie more than 90 degrees away from lead two, or leftward enough that this does qualify as left anterior hemiblock. We conclude this ECG video on the basics of axis and hemiblocks with insight on how to apply the principles we've covered when there is bundle branch block, and how to recognize the uncommon situation when there is a posterior hemiblock. To follow our discussion of this slide, you may want to review our 17-minute ECG video on the basics of bundle branch block, which you can find at www.bbbecg.com. So, the QRS complex is obviously wide in the schematic tracing. Is QRS morphology in leads 1, V1, and V6 within the red rectangles suggestive of bundle branch block? The answer is yes. The RSR prime complex with taller right rabbit ear in lead V1 with positive R waves and wide terminal S wave deflections in leads 1 and V6 is typical for complete right bundle branch block. But is there also a hemi block? As was the case when the QRS complex was narrow, the lead that we focus on to determine if left anterior hemi block is present is lead two. Realize that the concept of axis changes when there is a conduction system defect because the sequence of depolarization is completely altered when there is right bundle branch block, left bundle branch block, or IVCD. By definition, the presence of left bundle branch block means that conduction is impaired in both the left anterior and posterior hemifascicles, so it doesn't make sense to talk about a hemiblock when the reason for QRS widening is complete left bundle branch block. But there can be, in addition to complete right bundle branch block, either a left anterior or left posterior hemiblock. As we have emphasized, left posterior hemiblock is rare, but left anterior hemiblock 
is commonly seen together with right bundle branch block and it is easy to recognize by the presence of a negative net deflection in lead two. Therefore, both right bundle branch block and left anterior hemi block are present in the schematic tracing, which we classify as a bifascicular block. Now look at A. Now compare A to B. Look in particular at the S wave in lead one of A and compare it to the S wave in lead one of B. What is the difference? I think you can appreciate that the initial straight portion of the S wave descent in B is steeper. This is what you see when there is left posterior hemiblock. Remember that the reason left posterior hemiblock is so uncommon is that the left posterior hemifascicle is so much thicker than the anterior hemifascicle, as well as enjoying a dual blood supply from both the right and left coronary arteries. So left posterior hemiblock almost never occurs as an isolated conduction defect. Instead, on those uncommon situations in which it is seen, it will almost always occur in association with right bundle branch block as another form of bifascicular block. In such cases, the QRS complex looks as it does here, with QRS morphology consistent with right bundle branch block and the presence of a very steep descent to the S wave in lead one with a fairly tall R wave in lead two, and usually also in lead three. That's it for this ECG video on the basics of axis and hemi blocks. This is Ken Grauer saying goodbye for now. Du plus loin que me revienne l'ombre de mes amours anciens.